Chapters 15 and 16 of Above Life's Turmoil. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Fiore. Above Life's Turmoil by James Allen. Chapter 15. Self-Discipline. A man does not live until he begins to discipline himself. He merely exists. Like an animal, he gratifies his desires and pursues his inclinations just where they may lead him. He is happy as a beast is happy, because he is not conscious of what he is depriving himself. He suffers as the beast suffers, because he does not know the way out of suffering. He does not intelligently reflect upon life, and lives in a series of sensations, longings, and confused memories which are unrelated to any central idea or principle. A man whose inner life is so ungoverned and chaotic must necessarily manifest this confusion in the visible conditions of his outer life in the world, and though for a time, running with the stream of his desires, he may draw to himself a more or less large share of the outer necessities and comforts of life, he never achieves any real success, nor accomplishes any real good, and sooner or later worldly failure and disaster are inevitable as the direct result of the inward failure to properly adjust and regulate those mental forces which make the outer life. Before a man accomplishes anything of an enduring nature in the world, he must first of all acquire some measure of success in the management of his own mind. This is as mathematical a truism as that two and two are four, for out of the heart are the issues of life. If a man cannot govern the forces within himself, he cannot hold a firm hand upon the outer activities which form his visible life. On the other hand, as a man succeeds in governing himself, he rises to higher and higher levels of power and usefulness and success in the world. The only difference between the life of the beast and that of the undisciplined man is that the man has a wider variety of desires and experiences a greater intensity of suffering. It may be said of such a man that he is dead, being truly dead, to self-control, chastity, fortitude, and all of the nobler qualities which constitute life. In the consciousness of such a man, the crucified Christ lies entombed, awaiting that resurrection which shall revify the mortal sufferer and wake him up to a knowledge of the realities of his existence. With the practice of self-discipline, a man begins to live, for he then commences to rise above the inward confusion and to adjust his conduct to a steadfast center within himself. He ceases to follow where inclination leads him, reins in the steed of his desires, and lives in accordance with the dictates of reason and wisdom. Hitherto his life has been without purpose or meaning, but now he begins to consciously mold his own destiny. He is clothed in his right mind. In the process of self-discipline, there are three stages, namely, 1. Control, 2. Purification, 3. Relinquishment. A man begins to discipline himself by controlling those passions which have hitherto controlled him. He resists temptation and guards himself against all those tendencies to self-gratifications which are so easy and natural, and which have formerly dominated him. He brings his appetite into subjection, and begins to eat as a reasonable and responsible being, practicing moderation and thoughtfulness in the selection of his food, with the object of making his body a pure instrument through which he may live and act as becomes a man, and no longer degrading that body by pandering to gustatory pleasure. He puts a check upon his tongue, his temper, and in fact, his every animal desire and tendency, and this he does by referring all acts to a fixed center within himself. It is a process of living from within outward, instead of, as formerly, from without inward, he conceives an ideal, and enshrining that ideal in the sacred recesses of his heart, he regulates his conduct in accordance with its exaction and demands. 
There is a philosophical hypothesis that at the heart of every atom and every aggregation of atoms in the universe, there is a motionless center which is the sustaining source of all the universal activities. Be this as it may, there is certainly in the heart of every man and woman a selfless center without which the outer man could not be, and the ignoring of which leads to suffering and confusion. The selfless center which takes the form in the mind of an ideal of unselfishness and spotless purity, the attainment of which is desirable, is man's eternal refuge from the storms of passion and all the conflicting elements of his lower nature. It is the rock of ages, the Christ within, the divine and immortal in all men. As a man practices self-control, he approximates more and more to this inward reality, and is less and less swayed by passion and grief, pleasure and pain, and lives a steadfast and virtuous life, manifesting manly strength and fortitude. The restraining of the passions, however, is merely the initial stage in self-discipline, and is immediately followed by the process of purification. By this a man so purifies himself as to take passion out of the heart and mind altogether, not merely restraining it when it rises within him, but preventing it from rising altogether. By merely restraining his passions, a man can never arrive at peace, can never actualize his ideal. He must purify those passions. It is in the purification of his lower nature that a man becomes strong and godlike, standing firmly upon the ideal center within, and rendering all temptations powerless and ineffectual. This purification is effected by thoughtful care, earnest meditation, and holy aspiration, and as success is achieved, confusion of mind and life pass away, and calmness of mind and spiritualized conduct ensure. True strength and power and usefulness are born of self-purification, for the lower animal forces are not lost, but are transmuted into intellectual and spiritual energy. The pure life, pure in thought and deed, is a life of conservation of energy. The impure life, even though the impurity should not extend beyond thought, is a life of dissipation of energy. The pure man is more capable and therefore more fit to succeed in his plans and to accomplish his purposes than the impure. Where the impure man fails, the pure man will step in and be victorious because he directs his energies with a calmer mind and a greater definiteness and strength of purpose. With the growth in purity, all the elements which constitute a strong and virtuous manhood are developed in an increasing degree of power, and as man brings his lower nature into subjection and makes his passions do his bidding, just so much will he mold the outer circumstances of his life and influence others for good. The third stage of self-discipline, that of relinquishment, is a process of letting the lower desires and all impure and unworthy thoughts drop out of the mind, and also refusing to give them any admittance, leaving them to perish. As a man grows purer, he perceives that all evil is powerless unless it receives his encouragement, and so he ignores it and lets it pass out of his life. It is by pursuing this aspect of self-discipline that a man enters into and realizes the divine life and manifests those qualities which are distinctly divine, such as wisdom, patience, non-resistance, compassion, and love. It is here also where a man becomes consciously immortal, rising above all the fluctuations and uncertainties of life, and living in an intelligent and unchangeable peace. By self-discipline, a man attains to every degree of virtue and holiness, and finally becomes a purified son of God, realizing his oneness with the central heart of all things. Without self-discipline, a man drifts lower and lower, approximating more and more nearly to the beast, until at last he grovels, a lost creature, in the mirror of his own befoulment. By self-discipline, a man rises higher and higher, 
approximating more and more nearly to the divine, until at last he stands erect in his divine dignity, a saved soul, glorified by the radiance of his purity. Let a man discipline himself, and he will live. Let a man cease to discipline himself, and he will perish. As a tree grows in beauty, health, and fruitfulness by being carefully pruned and tended, so a man grows in grace and beauty of life by cutting away all the branches of evil from his mind, and as he tends and develops the good by constant and unfailing effort. As a man by practice acquires proficiency in his craft, so the earnest man acquires proficiency in goodness and wisdom. Men shrink from self-discipline because in its early stages it is painful and repellent, and the yielding to desire is, at first, sweet and inviting, but the end of desire is darkness and unrest, whereas the fruits of discipline are immortality and peace. Chapter 16 Resolution Resolution is the directing and impelling force in individual progress. Without it, no substantial work can be accomplished. Not until a man brings resolution to bear upon his life does he consciously and rapidly develop, for a life without resolution is a life without aims, and a life without aims is a drifting and unstable thing. Resolution may, of course, be linked to downward tendencies, but it is more usually the companion of noble aims and lofty ideals, and I am dealing with it in this, its highest use and application. When a man makes a resolution, it means that he is dissatisfied with his condition, and is commencing to take himself in hand with a view in producing a better piece of workmanship out of the mental materials of which his character and life are composed. And in so far as he is true to his resolution, he will succeed in accomplishing his purpose. The vows of the saintly, once are holy resolutions directed towards some victory over self, and the beautiful achievements of holy men and the glorious conquests of the divine teachers were rendered possible and actual by the pursuit of unswerving resolution. To arrive at the fixed determination, to walk a higher path than hitherto for, although it reveals the great difficulties which have to be surmounted, it yet makes possible the treading of that path and illuminates its dark places with the golden halo of success. The true resolution is the crisis of long thought, protracted struggle, or fervent but unsatisfied aspiration. It is no light thing, no whimsical impulse or vague desire, but a solemn and irrevocable determination not to rest nor cease from effort until the high purpose which is held in view is fully accomplished. Half-hearted and premature resolution is no resolution at all and it is shattered by the first difficulty. A man should be slow to form a resolution. He should searchingly examine his position and take into consideration every circumstance and difficulty connected with his decision, and should be fully prepared to meet them. He should be sure that he completely understands the nature of his resolution, that his mind is finally made up, and that he is without fear and doubt in the matter. With the mind thus prepared, the resolution that is formed will not be departed from, and by the aid of it a man will, in due time, accomplish his strong purpose. Hasty resolutions are futile. The mind must be fortified to endure. Immediately, the resolution to walk a higher path is made. Temptation and trial begin. Men have found that no sooner have they decided to lead a truer and nobler life then they have been overwhelmed with such a torrent of new temptations and difficulties as to make their position almost unendurable, and many men, because of this, relinquish their resolution. But these temptations and trials are a necessary part of the work of regeneration upon which the man has decided, and must be hailed as friends, and met with courage if the resolution is to do its work. For what is the real nature of a resolution? Is it not the sudden checking of a particular stream of conduct and the endeavor to open up an entirely new channel? Think of an engineer 
who decides to turn the course of a powerfully running stream or river in another direction. He must first cut out his new channel, and must take every precaution to avoid failure in the carrying out of his undertaking. But when he comes to the all-important task of directing the stream into its new channel, then the flowing force, which for ages has steadily pursued its accustomed course, becomes refractory, and all the patience and care and skill of the engineer will be required for the successful completion of the work. It is even so with the man who determines to turn his course of conduct in another and higher direction. Having prepared his mind, which is the cutting of a new channel, he then proceeds to the work of redirecting his mental forces, which have hitherto flowed on uninterruptedly into the new course. Immediately this is attempted, the arrested energy begins to assert itself in the form of powerful temptations and trials, hitherto unknown and unencountered. And this is exactly as it should be. It is the law, and the same law that is in the water is in the mind. No man can improve upon the established law of things, but he can learn to understand the law instead of complaining and wishing things were different. The man who understands all that is involved in the regeneration of his mind will glory in tribulations, knowing that only by passing through them can he gain strength, obtain purity of heart, and arrive at peace. And as the engineer at last, perhaps after many mistakes and failures, succeeds in getting the stream to flow on peacefully in the broader and better channel, and the turbulence of the water is spent, and all dams can be removed, so the man of resolution at last succeeds in directing his thoughts and acts into the better and nobler way to which he aspires, and temptations and trials give place to steadfast strength and settled peace. He whose life is not in harmony with his conscience, and who is anxious to remedy his mind and conduct in a particular direction, let him first mature his purpose by earnest thought and self-examination, and having arrived at a final conclusion, let him frame his resolution and having done so, let him not swerve from it, let him remain true to his decision under all circumstances, and he cannot fail to achieve his good purpose, for the great law ever shields and protects him, who no matter how deep his sins, or how great his many failures and mistakes, has, deep in his heart, resolved upon the finding of a better way, and every obstacle must at last give way before a matured and unshaken resolution. End of chapters 15 and 16 Recording by Andrea Fiore